Once again, we like in TypeScript is it actually is a very uh, statically typed language. Now, if you're programmed in JavaScript, you already know this. JavaScript is very far away from static typing. JavaScript is one of the most dynamically typed languages. And then honestly, one of the things I really like about JavaScript is the ability, the flexibility that it offers from, uh, from dynamic typing. But TypeScript says, I'm going to give you static typing. So if you're programmed in languages like C Sharp or programmed in languages like uh, C++ or Java, you are used to static typing, and TypeScript gives you that. But the second thing about TypeScript is it's a superset of JavaScript. So which means everything you can write in JavaScript, you can write in TypeScript. But of course, not everything you would write in TypeScript is valid JavaScript syntax. But it compiles down to JavaScript at that point, and that's basically what it is going to provide for you. So given this, let's talk about what, what we can do, how we can use it. Like I said, it compiles down to JavaScript, and that's what you're going to use it. And I mentioned that it's statically typed, but how does it really work? So let's start with a little example here. So I want to start with just a little message called hi here, and I'm running it, you can see. Well, the file name is called, in this case, sample.ts. So I've given the extension called ts. Well, before we go any further, let's talk about what's actually going on. Well, TypeScript is a language that compiles down to JavaScript, but you know one thing about JavaScript today, JavaScript definitely is no longer a language that you run only on a browser. That changed quite rapidly. You could run JavaScript on browsers, of course. You could run JavaScript on a, a server side, like a node, for example. You could run JavaScript within the J, a JVM. You could run JavaScript within other environments like .NET. So as a result, it makes no sense to say that JavaScript would be only running within a browser. In fact, for all practical purposes, from the test Testability point of view, I rarely want to test my JavaScript within a browser because it's just inconvenient to do so. I want to be able to automate it and test it, and even if, if at all I have to use a br browser, I probably would use a headless browser. So what TypeScript does is TypeScript simply compiles your uh, TypeScript uh, code to JavaScript, and how you would run your JavaScript entirely depends on where your deployment is. If you're going to deploy it on a browser, obviously, you would run that code in a browser. If you want to run it within a node, you would run it within a node. TypeScript doesn't care where you run it. It simply produces the JavaScript for you. Well, in this case, I wrote a console.log, and my intention in this particular case is to run it in node, but I could also run it in browser. I'll show you an example of running in a browser a little later. But how does this really work? So I'm going to first of all run the compiler, and I'm going to run this file called sample.ts, and all that this does is creates a sample.js file. Of course, you can tell it to create a different file. In fact, for most, most of the examples, I'll be creating a different file than the same name because I don't get confused by looking at the file name. But if you look at the sample.ts file for a minute, and if you look at the file sample.js, Guess what? It's exactly the same in this particular case. Because all I wrote was JavaScript within TypeScript. And, and TypeScript said, well, you made my life really easy, and just spit out the code and said, I'm done, right? So that's basically what we created in here. But of course, I can run this code. So I would normally say node, and then I would run sample.js. And it says, hi. Well, that's exactly what I was doing a few minutes ago. But I'm going to get rid of the sample.js file. And I only have the ts file on my hand. So that's what we saw so far. However, it's quite possible that when you're writing code in TypeScript, you would run into some errors. Now, when you run into some errors, by default, what TypeScript compiler is going to do is it's going to complain to you because there's an error with TypeScript. But remember, JavaScript really has no compile time error, right? Because there's no compiler for JavaScript. Almost every error you get in JavaScript is at runtime. So by default, what TypeScript compiler does is it'll give you the error but it'll still go ahead and produce the uh, JavaScript for you, maybe with a little message that says, good luck with it, right? Well, you can tell it, no, 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 don't do that. If there's an error, 
I would much rather not produce the JavaScript. And if you don't want to produce the JavaScript, then use the dash dash no emit on error, then it would not produce the JavaScript file for you when there is an error. And I highly recommend using that because you don't want to, after all, the purpose of using TypeScript is to get a better control on your code. You don't want to generate your JavaScript code. So I would highly recommend using that particular option to say, hey, don't create this for me if there is an error. Well, now comes the fun part about the language itself that we're going to take a look at. So let's get to the TypeScript language. What does it do? Well, the very first thing about TypeScript is it is statically typed. So what does that mean it's statically typed? Well, I'm going to say var, and I'm going to say, let's say, a, a greet, and I'm going to say here is our string equals hi. And I'm going to now print out the value of greet. So you can see in this case, it printed the value greet. And so that's static typing how I specified what the type is. Now you may be curious, wait a minute, but JavaScript doesn't have types. How does this really work? Well, this is purely, remember, if you are writing code in Java or writing code in C Sharp, you are only focused on the language at this point. You don't care about information in the bytecode or the IL level. Well, JavaScript is kind of like that in this context. You don't care about what it produces at that level. So in this particular case, as you can see, it produced that. But what if I said, for instance, over here, greet equals 1, and I'm going to then print out greet. Now, clearly, we are violating the type in this case, right? Because we said that greet is a string, and now we are trying to assign a value of 1. So if you notice in this case, we get a compilation error. And the error says, I'm sorry, you cannot set a value of 1 to greet because it's a string. Now, had I not set the option not to create JavaScript, it would have given this error and produce JavaScript. But because I said, don't create JavaScript when I was doing this, you would notice it doesn't create the JavaScript file because of this error. Now, one of the nice things about TypeScript also is not only is it statically typed, it is also has a healthy dose of type inference. I really enjoy this type inference because type inference is where it meaningfully infers the type based on a context. In other words, when you look at this code right here, notice you said var greet colon string equals high. Now I'm going to remove that string, and I've said that greet equals high. In your wildest imagination, can you think about what type greet would be if you assign it to a high? A donkey? Not really, right? It's pretty clear what it's going to be. It's got to be a string, right? Well, that is basically what type inference is. So type inference basically says, based on the context of the definition, infer the type so we don't have to redundantly say what the type is, right? So you don't have to say. Uh, unnecessarily information that can be gathered based on a certain context. But make no mistake, you cannot assign a value of 1 in this code. You get exactly the same error. Why? Because greet has been created as a string. You cannot possibly assign a value of number to it. If I change it to a double coded string, notice it has no problem moving forward. But of course, in this case, I'm giving a string value rather than giving a number, and it's pretty happy with it. So we talked about the static typing nature. We also talked about how the type inference kicks in. And so when you're programming with, uh, uh, with uh, TypeScript, even though it is statically typed, you would want to leverage as much as you can the, the uh, facility of type inference because that just reduces the noise in code. But one other thing that you can trust with um, TypeScript is you are required to define variables, declare variables before you use them. Now, one thing in Java, if you put var of a variable within a function, that variable scope is within the function. But if you don't put var, what does JavaScript do? That's correct. It makes it a global scope, which can be pretty dangerous, right? So TypeScript says, if you don't put var, 
I'm going to give you an error because you have not defined the type yet. So notice in this case, I get an error saying, cannot find the name greet, what are you talking about, right? So it immediately gives me an error saying, I'm sorry, I cannot really if you assign to a variable called greet or use it because you haven't defined it first. So this is just like in C Sharp or Java. If you don't define a variable, obviously you cannot use it. It either has to be defined within the function or it's got to be in a defining scope or you have to bring it in as a parameter those rules still apply here. So that is given for us, which is pretty nice. Again, remember, if you don't set the flag, it'll still create the JavaScript for you. Please. Yeah. So the type is inference. Yes. Uh, so we have defined the uh, value there, so it will infer. So what if the return, uh, instead of defining, we were calling another function, and internally it was returning you know, uh, string ones and a number otherwise, Right. So the question is, what's going to happen? It, really good question. Thanks for asking that. So what the question is, what's going to happen when you define functions? Will it infer? The answer is yes, but we'll take a look at an example in just a few minutes. So it can go down and try to infer the type as well. Well, generally speaking, when you're writing a function, it's a good idea for you to define the type of the return because somebody using the function gets an immediate clue of what that is. But if you want to really let language infer it, it'll do it, but the disadvantage is person using it is going to be a little bit clueless. So, so there's a balance between what the language does for you versus what you want to do for the user of your code. So that's a balance you have to strike. So, so good question. But once we look at this now, you can see in this case, OK, this is great. But unfortunately, this paradigm breaks a little bit. There are times when we do want to use variables without defining them. And the reason is those variables are defined for us from an external context. Your JavaScript, when it runs within a browser, has a window object, has a document object. Now, if this you know, says, oh, you can't use a window without defining it, now you're in trouble. Because if you define a window, that's going to shadow that variable and then it's not going to be that variable, so that it's going to become a mess. Well, so there are some files that are defining types for you already, but what if you're really running an environment where you really don't uh, have a way to define it here, but you want to really bring it? That's where it's called an ambient variable. So what you do for an ambient variable, I'll give you an example of this. I'm going to say alert, and I'm going to alert a dollar symbol. Notice I get an error, a compilation error, but notice where the error is coming from. The error is coming from sample.ts, which means that TypeScript is giving this error saying, I don't understand what the dollar is, right? So it's out to imagine that anybody won't understand what a dollar is, but this doesn't understand what a dollar is. Well, why, is it, why doesn't it understand? Because there's no context to say what the dollar is. Of course, you know, what does a dollar mean? Well, in our context, probably it's a jQuery call. So what would you want to do? So what you can do is you can simply say, in this case, I'm going to use a declare. That's what I want to start with. So I'm going to say declare, and I'm going to say dollar as a variable right here. Now notice, that was a bigger error. But that error was not from TypeScript. That error was from me trying to run the JavaScript because a poor JavaScript with the node says, what are you talking about? I don't have a clue what a dollar is. But we'll fix that in just a minute. But we got past TypeScript through this. Now, in a way, if you want to think about it, if you're programmed in languages like C++, C Sharp, you're familiar with the word called forward declaration. So think of this like a forward declaration saying, I'm not going to define this here, but the definition comes from elsewhere. But in this case, they're calling it an ambient variable, so that kind of pulls it in. But to understand how this is working, I'm going to bring in an index.html file here. And notice in this particular case, the index.html is referring to the uh, location for the jQuery. And then it's going to load up the sample.js, which means this would have brought in the dollar definition already. And assuming that my internet connection is working here properly, when I bring this up, it should really pop up and tell us, well, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to 
to pick it, pick it up. But you get the point. That's basically what the idea behind this is. So in, in this case, it should have displayed us the alert message to say, here is what the dollar is. But as you can see, it did not give us any error. Well, to show that it didn't give us any error, it did compile the file. And all you see is an alert dollar without the declare, as you can see. That's because of the definition. However, if I remove the declare and try to run it, you can see that it gave a compilation error. But if you go back to the compile.js, well, that file is going to be empty now because I told him not to generate the file if there was a syntactical error. And of course, he gave us the error because of that. So that shows us how we can do ambient uh, uh, variable, ambient variables. What about comparisons? Well, comparing variables is a sticky issue in JavaScript, right? Because the double equals messes up by comparing after casting. We have to use three equals, and then it becomes a mess. Well, well, TypeScript says, I'm going to perform a lot more rigorous uh, checking for you. So let's look at one example of this. So I'm going to go back to TypeScript again. I'm going to say, here is a variable A, which is a 1. Let's also define a variable B, which is a 1, a variable C, which is a 2, and finally a variable D, which is going to be a value 1. Now, you know in JavaScript, one double equals doll, uh, uh, string one will yield a true, right? You know that. That's what JavaScript does. Let's go ahead and say A is equal to B. And you can see that it's actually true, because A is equal to B. What about A equal to C? That obviously will be false, because A is not equal to C. What if I say A equal to D, though? Well, that's a type mismatch. So you can see we get a compilation error saying you cannot compare between those two types because you know it doesn't make sense to compare across two types. Again, keep in mind, this is as if the JavaScript is the binary. This compiler says, I will not let you pass me if you made these errors. And if you don't have any errors in the code, then it produces JavaScript with that option I talked about. So this is much like you are dealing with a completely different language that just compiles down to JavaScript. In fact, that's what it exactly is. So comparisons are done fairly well. But one question you may have is, you say, wait a minute, but if I did make a proper comparison, and it did say true, well, what does it look like in the underlying code? Well, unfortunately, though, if you look at the underlying code, they still used double equals and not triple equals. And the justification there is we already have done the verification, so it doesn't really matter whether we use two or three, even though I would have preferred them to use a three equals rather than two equals, because that would be the right way to write JavaScript itself. But they chose to use a double equals. Well, what about writing a function? Well, there are two ways to write a function here. One is to say function greet. And then you can say name, which is a string. Notice how I'm giving the type information. Then I could say, for example, here, hello. And then I could say specify plus name. And I could write the name. And I can call the greet function now. So we could say greet. And then let's say world right here, for example. So in this case, you can see it's going to print out hello world. So that is one way to write the function. It didn't look a whole lot different from what you would do in JavaScript, except you specify the type information. Now, about the type information, I don't know if you noticed this. In, in C sharp Java languages like that, you would have written string name like this, right? Whereas what we are doing here is you first specify the name, and then you specify this, right? So why is that? Well, most people. If you go ask them what their name is, they'll just say what the name is. But James Bond is different, right? He always says Bond, James Bond. It's kind of like that. No, just kidding. So the point really is, it emphasizes in this case, the name is the most important thing. You remember giving a name for a variable? What do you think of giving names with variable? Is that easy generally? No. It's easy to give names for children. But very difficult to give names for variables, right? So that is why they said variable name comes first, then comes the type. So that's the emphasis. This is kind of like what a lot of other languages do, like Scala, for example. So that's a pattern they're followed here, too, that we're going to have really the name given over here. That's one way to write it. But another way to write this is you can say greet to equals function. And then you could say string, for example. And then you could write, in this particular case, you can still write this as. And you can say, you know, console, let's say, howdy plus name. And in this case, of course, if you call greet to and again send world, 
you can see that it's going to call the greet to function. So that's yet another way. This, of course, is called an anonymous function. You could write it this way as well. It's your choice which way you want to go. But the question then is, what if this is going to return a result back to us? So I'm going to say, you know, uh, you know, value some, let's say, return a value 2 here. So let's go ahead and try this out for a second. So I'm going to print out the value that we get back from this function. So you can see it says undefined in this particular case, right? So what's happening? Well, it is returning a true, but I have not put the word return at this point. So let's put a word return. Now what happens? Well, it's returning a 2. But what is the type of that? Well, it's an integer. So I could go back here and say, well, I want this to be a number. And you can see that it accepts it. Going back to your question. However, if I did not say anything here for a minute, if I don't say that, and if I return this, it's still happy. But I change this to a double code, it is still happy. Because you didn't say it, you're able to change it. However, if I did say it's a number, but then if I go back here and change it to a string, you can see it uses an error. So that's why you have to decide, do you want to let it infer, which means whatever you type is what the type is, or do you want to say the type and make sure it conf confers with it? So it's a choice you have to make. Another choice you have to make is from the person calling the greet method, do they look at the code and say, oh, declaration says it's a number return. I got it or they got to examine through the code to figure it out, that can become a little bit more tricky. So inference kind of goes a little longer with that. What about declaring a callback? Well, if I want to declare a callback, let's go to this function one more time. And in this case, let's say I want to just call this method, but I want to really call a callback. So I'm going to say callback, and I'm going to say in this case, hello, and then plus the name given. And so when I call this function greet, I'm going to say in this case, uh, let's say earth link, but I want to specify a function. So I'm going to say function message. And in this case, I want to output the message given to me. So notice in this case, I am writing a function. I'm going to say string here. So this is going to receive a function as a parameter. And I'm going to pass that function as a callback. Now, obviously, I need to tell him what the callback is. But in addition to that, I want to also return uh, you know, something like back at you. So I want to really return some result as well from within this function, which I would probably get back here, and I would just print it. So I'm making a call to a callback. And then when the callback returns, I want to print the result of that here. But what does the callback take? The callback takes this message, and that's what this guy is saying. But how do I define a callback? Well, the callback, if you notice greet carefully, greet takes two parameters now. Greet takes the string, but the greet also is taking the function as well. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say callback, which is the name I gave for it. You can call it whatever you want to call it. doesn't matter. But that's a variable. But what's the type of this variable? It takes a string. And what does it do? Well, it's going to return to us a string as a result as well. So you are specifying that this is a transformation operation. So that arrow there says this function is a transformation of an input of this type to an output of that type. So that is how you specify that you are receiving a function as a parameter rather than just an object as a parameter. So that is a notation to say that name is a string, but callback, callback, actually, callback is actually a function that you're going to receive at this point. So that's a way for you to pass the callbacks and define how to send it. But of course, in this case, you can store this into a separate variable. So I could have said, for example, in this case, I could have taken this entire function right here. And I could have said uh, the callback. And then I could have said var the callback is equal to. And I can define this as a separate function. And I can call it. And absolutely, then not only can you reuse it, it becomes easier to test it as well. And then you don't have to clutter this code. So that, that flexibility you have certainly with you. So that's about declaring a callback. But one of the interesting things you can do here is you can have optional parameters. So what does it mean you can have optional parameters? Let's go ahead and define a greet this time, where I'm going to take a name as a parameter. 
But I'm going to say, well, I don't know what kind of greetings to give, right? It depends on the friends I meet. And sometimes I want to greet them with different words. So in this case, I'm going to call greet. And I'm going to call greet with just the name for a minute, right? So let's say in this case, I'll say world. And all I'm going to do simply is print out in this case. And I'll simply say hello plus the name here, for example, right? So you could specify that. But I'm also interested in saying greet world. And then I could say, you know, for example, hi. Well, now I want to send an additional parameter. But that parameter is optional. Well, how do I say that this parameter is actually optional? So I can go back here and say message question colon string. And that simply says that message is entirely optional. Then I can say if the message was given, then I would like to simply say in this case, the message plus the value. So this would be changed to, let's say, something like message plus, and maybe a space over there. Otherwise, I want a high in there. So the question indicates an optional value that you can specify. So this simply says, if you put an option, a question, then the compiler says, all right, if you don't specify a value, I'm happy with it. Now, I want you to think about one thing. In JavaScript, arguments are always variable length. JavaScript doesn't care how many parameters you send. At the point of definition, you cannot say how many parameters you're going to receive. The caller decides how many parameters you're going to send. And that can be quite confusing sometimes. But this one moves it back to the definition to say, well, when you're defining, you say how many parameters you want. And if you want one to be optional, you can say that it's optional. You can have more than one that's optional too. But all the optional parameters have to be the trailing parameters. Not the, you cannot mix them between required and optional back and forth. So that gives us an idea about how we can specify this. You can also use a default value if you are interested in. So rather than going through all of this, you could simply say message like you saw here. But notice in this case, it says undefined world. But rather than that, you can simply say, well, here is a hello. And so in this case, if you don't specify it, it can become a default value. So either it can be optional or it can be default, and you get to pick and choose what may make sense to you, depending on the context. Well, that's great, but there's one other feature that's really nice in JavaScript, where even though it can be a troublesome quite a bit, is that you can have variable number of parameters. So what if I really want variable number of parameters? How do I really do that? Well, actually, it's very easy to do it. For example, let's say I want to write a function called the greet, and I'm going to take a name, which is a string, and in this case, I'm going to simply print out, let's say, the name itself. So I'll say hello plus the name. Well, in this case, of course, I could simply call this as greet. And let's go ahead and say, you know, for example, Jack over here. So in this case, it's going to say hello, Jack. But what if I really want to pass a bunch of values here? For example, I want to send Tom and I want to send Jerry. I can also say I want to call greet, but I want to say Jack, uh, maybe Jill. And I could send maybe, uh, what about, say, something like Joker? And I could send a bunch of values, right? So what if I want to send a bunch of values? How do I really make all of these things work? Well, as you can see here is truly a variable number of parameters. So what you can do in this case is you can say that I have name, which is a required parameter. But following that, I'm going to say that in this particular case, I have others, which is a string array that I'm going to send to it. So in that case, I can say over here, plus, And then we could say plus again, others dot join. And I can ask them to be joined with the space. And you can see that you can pass a variable number of parameters fairly easily. So the dot, 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 which we normally call as ellipsis or a var arg, is exactly what we are using here, except you put it before the variable name in this case, and then followed by the type. And that gives you the ability to pass a variable number of parameters, which could be 0 or more. And you can pass it very easily.
But along the same way, just quickly to try, revisit the type inference that we talked about and the type checking, you can see in this case I can call greet with, let's say, you know, uh, Joe, and you can see that it's pretty happy with it, no complaints obviously, so you can see that it's okay. So in fact, I'll just say okay here, so we can see that it's okay with it. So if I just pass the value Joe, it is happy with it, but on the other hand, if I were to call greet and send a value of 1, you can see that it's not very happy because it's uh, it, because of type checking, right? So once again, it says, oh, wait, the function says you want a string. You cannot pass it. However, there are times when you do want to perform overloading. So you want to allow maybe a string, and you want to allow a number, but maybe not something else. What can you do? Well, what you can do for that is you can try something like this. First of all, you can declare a function greet, and then you can say name is a string, and then you can simply end it with a forward declaration, and then you can simply say here is a function greet, which is going to take something else, maybe a value, which is a number. So you have given two different values in this particular case as the values that you would comfortably accept in this particular case. And then once you do, you can see in this case, you can call this with greet Joe, he's happy with it. You can also call it with greet one, he is happy with it. But you cannot call greet with maybe something like this, and he's not going to be happy if you send a JSON object, and it says, no, I'm sorry, that's not a compatible type. Now, of course, what you would have to do within the function is you would have to check for certain values, type off, and see what the type of the object is and make a decision. Because remember, JavaScript does not have function overloading. So just because the language tries to pretend like there's function overloading, the JavaScript is not going to give you that, so you got to be very careful about it. So since JavaScript doesn't have a function overloading, you still have to manage the type information. The code can become a little messy. My argument generally in that case is, why bother? Write two different functions with two different names and be done with it. Life is much simpler that way than trying to mess with that. So great so far, but how do you create lambda expressions? Well, lambda expressions are anonymous functions. And even though JavaScript has anonymous functions, the syntax becomes pretty verbose. It would be nice to create a lambda expression, which is a lot more simpler to use. Well, thankfully, it's very easy to create a lambda expression. So all you do is you create a lambda. So what, for example, greet equals. And I'm going to say here is a name which is a string, and I'm going to simply specify, let's say in this case, console right line, uh, a log, and I'm going to say hello, and then plus the name itself. So that's my lambda. I could call greet here and say world one more time. And this time we wrote it as a lambda expression rather than writing it as a full-blown function. So you don't have to use the word function at this point. You can simply specify the uh, name and be done with it, uh, the parameter list and be done with it. So that saves you a little bit of effort. But let's get a feel for how this is going to look like when we use in a real good context. So let's say, for example, numbers equals, let's say, one, two, three, and four, a few values, let's say, we're going to have here. And what I want to do is I want to filter the values that are in this collection. So I would say numbers.filter. And if you're writing this in JavaScript, you would say function give an element. And then you would say return element mark 2 is equal to 0. And then you would write this much code. And this would give you all the values which are even. And then, of course, you can print that out at the very end. So that is how you would write code in JavaScript. Well, because TypeScript is superscript of JavaScript, it let you still do that. But you, you don't want to do this. Instead, what you can do here is simply say numbers.filter. And now that we have anonymous functions, you simply say e mark 2 is equal to 0. And that's uh, going to be simply saying, I will accept a lambda. So look at the re reduced noise in this code. And obviously, I would put that in the same line here. Assuming the font size was small enough for me to display here in this monitor, you would have seen that in the same line. So that is basically a reduction in code. All that extra noise is simply gone. And so that's a syntax you're going to use.
uh, probably looks a lot like what you would do in C sharp, right? So that's a very similar syntax, C sharp, Scala, a lot of these languages use a similar syntax, so that's what they have done here as well. So we saw how to use lambdas, but let's shift our focus to uh, interfaces. Well, classes and inheritance is pretty bothersome in JavaScript. Remember what JavaScript uses. JavaScript uses prototypal inheritance, which is actually a superior form of inheritance than what inheritance we get from languages like C Sharp and Java. But unfortunately though, they took something wonderful and totally messed it up with the uh, way that they gave it uh, you know, available to us with multiple you know, uh, places where we got to go inject into this class. And so we, it kind of the essence of it was kind of lost in the, in the mix. Well, when you write inheritance in, uh, in classes in job, uh, uh, type safe, you are still converting it to prototypal inheritance. There, that doesn't go away. But it gives a better elegant syntax for us to work with as long as you keep this in mind that you're still using prototypal inheritance. Sometimes it's easy to forget and get into some mess. We've got to be careful about it. But let's talk about the interface. So I'm going to say interface here. And the interface is going to be called, let's call it as lat long. And I'm going to say in this case, lat is going to be a number long is going to be a number, but there's one more interesting thing you can do with interfaces in TypeScript. Now, if you talk about interfaces in languages like Java or C Sharp or C++, interfaces will declare what you should carry, and the implementers are required to carry all of that. But if you look at languages like um, Objective-C, those languages do something a little different. Language like Objective-C says, well, interfaces can have required properties, but interfaces can also have so-called optional properties, which is a pretty interesting concept where your interfaces can say, minimally you should have this, but as an extra you can have these things. Well, you can do that here fairly easily. So I have a location here, but I'm going to say favorite, and the favorite location is going to be maybe a location Boolean. But I don't require the favorite to be there, so guess how I would define it? That's correct, with a question, right? We saw this already, so you can say, hey, that's going to be optional, and so this is not required. But then what I can do here is, I can define a function called show location, which is going to take a position, I'll call it location, and this location is going to be a lat long, and what am I going to do within this function? I'm going to simply output, let's output the location dot lat, plus let's say I want to output the uh, location dot uh, long, and then I'm going to also output, let's say, whether it's favorite or not. So location dot favorite. So now that I have all those three, I'm interested in calling the show location. But here comes the charm. I can simply say lat, for example, and then I can say long, for example, and I can specify these values, only the required values I could specify. And notice I sent a JSON object where an interface was expected, and it was quite happy to say, yep, you got everything I actually need from you. But you can also go back here and say a favorite, and then you can specify true, for example, and that becomes your favorite location as well. However, if you remove the long, you get an error because that's a required. So you can use an interface very fluidly by passing those things into it. This pretty much takes us to what's called a structural mapping of classes. So what that means is, now that we defined this, let's go ahead and say class, and we will say position. And the position has a lat, which is a number, and a long, which is a number, and a constructor, which is going to say lat, which is a number, and long, which is a number. And then it simply says this dot lat. So in this case, it's going to say this dot lat is equal to lat. And it says this dot long is equal to long. 
and now you can see that I have a position on my hand. Now I can say show location, new position, and I can specify 4105, and I can pass a position to this rather than having to create a particular uh, location. So I've created a class called position, which is a number along, and let's call it as, uh, you know, let's call it as my position for a minute. So I have a position in this case, and the constructor says, give me these two parameters, lat and long, and I'm going to pass the lat and long to this particular constructor. So I come down here where the lat long is expected, which is the interface, and I'm going to say this is my position, and I can pass that value to it. So you can see in this case, I didn't really have to say anything more it was quite happy. This is called structurally mapping. But of course, if you really wanted to, you could have said implements, for example. And then you could have said lat long, and that would be perfectly fine. Now, what's the difference? If you don't say implements, if you have an error, you will meet the error here. But if you do say implements, and if you don't conform to the interface, you will get the error here. So it's a trade-off, right? Do you want to comply at the time of definition, or do you want to comply at the time of use? Well, you may say, why would I want to do one way or the other? If you're designing this from the ground up, and by intention you want to implement an interface, definitely say implements. However, you are bringing a third-party code, and you are accidentally realizing, hey, look, they got the same stuff that my interface wants here. Well, you don't have to really worry about it. The structural mapping will still accept it. So use implements for your own design and use the structural mapping for accidental coupling, uh, things that just kind of come in. So we saw how the structural mapping works. Well, we already saw how to create classes along, along the way. But let's remove some redundancy in this particular code. If you notice here, that's a lot of noise. This is one of the things I don't like much in languages where, oh, please, yes. It's a property rather than a variable. Notice we didn't give it a value. So it's a property rather than being a variable. And so it says your implementation has to provide a value for that property. So when you declare an interface, treat them as properties rather than uh, values. So. It, 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 well, so there is no concept of functions for that in this particular context, so it's really perceived as a property, that's what it is. Remember, at the JavaScript level, there's no interface after all, right? So it's just a class, so in the language context, treat them like your C-sharp properties, right? So these are just properties that this object interface has, because in C-sharp, interfaces can have properties, but interfaces cannot have fields, so think about it in the same notion. Yeah, good question. And do draw my attention, because I may not notice that you're raising your hand, and then you may think that this guy's rude, he's not responding, but it's a, it's, yeah, make a noise that way I'll know that you're asking question. Yeah. It can be to either one. So the question is, if there are two interfaces with exactly the same thing, what can I do? Well, before I answer that, you can actually define the same name twice as well, and it would keep adding properties to that along the way. So you could do that too. But it's based on what the receiver is. So if your function says, I want interface 1, my class would try to map to interface 1. If another function says I want interface 2, my class will map to interface 2. But if all the three have the same properties, well, then my class is you know, a substitutable for either one of them. It can work with either one of them in that context. Absolutely. So given this, this is a lot of redundancy here, as you can see. Well, thankfully, you don't have to duplicate as much. I removed the fields from here. And I'm going to remove the duplicate setter from here. And I'm going to simply say here, public, and I'm going to say public. So notice the rest of the code still works. This simply is the equivalent of what I just got rid of. The public, of course, says that that field is available for view. If you put private, then they will create it within a function and not avail make that av scope available. You cannot access it from the outside. So that's the difference between the two. So you can also create generics, for example. So for instance, let's say I want to create a class called a pair.
where my pair is going to be a generic type. So I could say, for example, in this case, value 1, which is of type T, and value 2, which is also of type T. So we can create a value 1 and value 2 pair, for example. And then I could create a constructor. And the constructor could say, you know, let's say public value 1, for example. And then we could say public value 2, using what we just did so far. We could write it like this, too. So that's all I did so far. Now what will happen? Now I could say, for example, var pair 1 equals new pair. And in this case, I could say this is going to be a string comma string. So that's a string pair. And then I could specify, you know, for example, Jack and Jill, for example, right? So I could create a pair here. And I could print out pair 1 dot value 1. And I could get that value being printed. Likewise, I could say print pair uh, 1 uh, dot value 2 and get that value printed as well. But what if I said var? A pair 2 equals new pair. And in this case, it's going to be number. And this is a number pair, so we'll say number. And then once I create this here, I want to say 1 and 2. So in this case, of course, I can print out pair 2 dot value 1 or 2. And you can see the value come through. But what if I were to say, rather than doing that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, create a pair, but I'm going to mix up the values. So I'm going to say var pair. Uh, let's say pair 3 equals new pair. And I'm going to say string. But in this case, I'm going to say you know a value. So that's going to become a compilation error for type, because that's a mismatch of type. So you can have generics too. Again, keep in mind that this gets translated down to uh, JavaScript, but the compiler is able to give you these kinds of checks. Well, you can also go to the next level of inheritance. So for example, let's say you have a class called vehicle. And the vehicle contains, let's say, a constructor. And it's going to say public, let's say, miles. And in this case, the miles value says uh, it's going to be a number. And I'm going to create a drive method. So I say drive. And the drive is going to be a function that takes a distance, which is a number. And then I'm going to say, in this particular case, that's how you define functions in here. So I'm going to say this dot miles plus equal to the distance. So we have a vehicle on our hand. Let's just create an example object here. So equals new vehicle with maybe a value 10. Output v1 dot miles to get the values out of it. So in this particular case, we are defining a vehicle object. Well, that wants to take a miles as a parameter. Let's get one thing done first, and then we'll come back to the other code after that. So that gives us the class with the value of 10, as we can see. But now I want to say in here, the value v1.drive, and I want to specify a distance to drive. When I'm done, I want to say miles to get the values out of it. So how do we go about doing that? Well, this is going to be the drive method. And I'm going to say this is going to be the distance, which is the number I want to specify as a parameter to this. right? And then what should I do within this? This dot miles, which is the value I want to change, equals this dot miles plus the distance given to us. And so I can start changing the values. So you can see that I'm writing a class with a method on it, a, me a, a function on it. But what if I want to use inheritance? So we could say class car. And you say extends a vehicle. So for inheriting from an interface, you use implements. To inherit from a class, you use the word extends. And this simply says, I want a prototypal extension. So now that you have an extends from it, what do you do here? Well, constructor. So you can say constructor. What is that going to do? Well, it's going to take a value of miles, which is a number. And I'm going to simply say super and pass the miles to it. So you can use the super notation to go ahead and call the base. And under the hood, what they would do is they would create the proper code using the prototypal inheritance to pass the data to the uh, prototype. So that is basically what this is going to do to pass that value over to the base. So now I can say var car equals new car and let's say 10. And I can now print out car.miles. And you can see that it's able to call that. But what about the drive method? So drive distance, which is a number. And I could then say here, super. And then I could pass the drive method. 
and call the distance with it and I can pass it on to the base as well. So in this case I can simply say output car dot miles but before that car dot drive let's say 10 you can see that it's being propagated down the chain. But of course just to show that it's actually coming here you can see that that method is being invoked as well. So you can do something very special here and then turn around and call the base as well. So in other words it's beginning to feel a lot like we're using a language with a certain amount of structure in place than the wilderness of JavaScript that we are used to, right? That's what you're getting from here. So given this, w yep, go ahead please. Yep. That's right, you're passing on to the base constructor. So there are, well, so the problem is this. Um, so the answer is, it would be nice to. However, a lot of times, you may receive two parameters, but you want to only pass one to the base and not the other one. So for example, my vehicle has a miles, but my car has a miles and color, for example. Well, in that case, I will keep the color, but I'll pass the miles to the base class, right? So they need, they need your help to know what you want to map, what field are you interested in mapping, so that's why you have to say what you're mapping over to. Uh, there are a few languages where you, know, you can just say super and they will out of passing. So for example, in this case, what if I just said super? Well, they don't quite support that. They, they still want you to say what is actually going on to the base class. Uh, language like Ruby has a little bit more support for it, but not TypeScript. Yeah. So that's basically what we saw so far. Now, what about function types? Function types are really interfaces. So you can specify an interface, for example, call back, for instance. And then you can specify, this takes a string and returns a string. So then what you can do is you can say function greet, and that takes a name as a string and takes a callback. So in this case, you can say something like callback is going to be a callback. So this simplifies the declaration of the function rather than trying to put the type information and the, remember the type arrow and then the return type, that simplifies that a little bit further. So you could simply say, oh, given this, I'm going to call the callback and pass the name to it, for example, right? So maybe with the word hello in it. So you could say hello and then plus the name. So in this case, I would call greet and I would say world, for example, and then, for example, in this case, I would simply say, well, function, and I could specify message, which is a string, and then, in this case, we could simply output the message, for instance, that we are receiving. So you could start doing it that way. So, oh, let's say what the problem is, nine, it's not happy with it. Well, the message is going to be a string that I'm passing to this, that's a string type. Oh, it's supposed to return a string back, that's what he's complaining about. So let's say return, uh, let's say got it. So in this case, of course, we are returning a result back. Now, of course, we also saw lambdas, so look at the beauty of this. I can simply say, given a string, all I want to do in this case is simply take that particular string and return this so we could get rid of quite a bit of ceremony with that and we can start working with just the lambda itself if that even makes sense. So in this case of course I'm receiving a string value, let's say this is the message that I'm interested in receiving and then I'm passing it down. Well, let's go ahead and see if we can do a little bit more. What about the return because it's a lambda? So no, in that case, of course, it's punishing us because we're putting multiple lines of code. So you can even replace it with a lambda. What about static members? I'll just mention that you can declare things static if you want to. So in front of the field, put the word static. In front of the functions, you put the word static. You got static variables, much like in Java or C Sharp. Nothing really special about it. But what about writing getters and setters? Like, for example, let's say I have a class called car, and I have a constructor which says public, and I want to specify miles, and this is going to be number. So that's good so far. And in this case, I'm going to say var car, and let's say the car is going to be a new car, and let's say 10 miles, and I want to print out, let's say, the car dot miles. But I want to say what color this particular car can actually have. So how do I go about saying what the color of this car could potentially be? Well, in this case, to say the color of the car, I got to have an extra parameter. So I'm going to say, 
I'm going to add a parameter, but in this case I'm going to say the parameter is going to be color and the type is going to be string. Now I'm going to say simply get and I'm going to say color and I'm going to simply return the color that this particular class holds. So we could say car.color and it's going to give us the color of the car. Well, in this particular case, the color of the car is going to be whatever the color is. So it's going to be the value that is going to return for us. So the get is going to give us the value. So get and property name is what I want to specify here. And that's going to return the value for us. Well, let's go ahead and say this is a black color car to begin with. So that's the value I'm going to give for this. So uh, let's see what the error says. Line number five is not very happy with it. So color is what I want to return from here which is the value, the color property. Oh, of course, this dot, right? Got to remember that. So there we go. So we got a black color car. But what about setter? Set color, and I'm going to say value string. And what should I do here? Well, I could say if the value is equal to, and maybe orange, right? Now, we can agree that orange color car is an ugly car, right? So I don't want orange color. So I could say throw. And I could say new or throw will say, sorry, uh, that color not supported, right? Uh, not supported. Sorry if you are a fan of orange color. I uh, didn't mean to offend you. My color is orange too, so, but I don't want an orange color car. So that's an example of how you could set that. Otherwise, you can say color equals value, right? So in this case, we have a setter. But how would I use the setter in this, in this particular context? So to use the color, what I'm going to do is simply say, oh, let's say car.color equals, let's say, a blue color car, right? Not that I like blue color cars either. So that sets the car's color to be blue in this case, so color, right? So you can see that that came out fine. Uh, oh, wait a minute. So that should be the color, uh, not console, color. So color. So that should be fine. But what if I try to set the color to something else? So I'll put a try block, and I'll put a catch block. And in this catch block, we'll put an exception and handle the exception. So in this case, we will say, well, print out the exception. So we'll say uh, car.color equals. And in this case, we'll say orange. And uh, let's see what it's going to do for us. So in this case, of course, it tells us, sorry, not supported. One last thing I want to quickly mention here is when you write, return a function from a particular class. So my class has a function. Let's say in this case, I'm going to say value, some sort of a value number is going to be a value of 6. Now I have a function here, foo. And the function foo says return function. And within this function, I'm going to say return this dot value. So just start with that for a minute. So now I'm going to say instance equals new my class. And then I'm going to say instance dot. And I'm going to get the function foo. That is going to return for me a function. I'll just say fn equals. Now I'm going to say fn and call that function. But what is it going to return for me? So if you notice what is being returned from here, well, it says undefined. Why is that? Because the value this is in the context of the function which is being returned by foo. But just as a matter of fact, if you don't return a function, but instead if you return, let's say, a lambda in this particular case, then the behavior is very different, as you will see in this particular case. So there is a benefit to returning lambdas rather than returning functions, because the context of this varies with it. So we saw what this particular language can provide for us. It provides a way for us to bring some sanity into the language syntax. It treats the binary as JavaScript, takes the code, performs fairly decent amount of type checking, and then creates the JavaScript for us. But in addition to type uh, checking, it also provides a number of other features like a streamlined way to create classes, streamlined way to create lambdas, much reduced noise in code. So as a result, it becomes a lot better. But the code it produces is JavaScript. So once you create JavaScript, you can run it within browsers. You can run it within Node. You can run it anywhere it makes sense, as long as you have the dependencies that are available for it. I hope you found that useful. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Venkat. Uh, we see a lot of people wanting to ask you questions, if possible. So we still have five minutes, so you can feel free to ask questions. In the meantime, we'll wait for others to join us for the next session. Now, how does this get? Does it get translated into all of them, or there's a common minimum factor or something like that? Because these guys use on based on the requirement basis. For animation, they use D3GS. For canvas stuff, paper GS. I've seen uh, mostly Angular GS. I'm not much aware of that because I'm mostly a C sharp developer. But so when you are using, so let's let's change the question a little bit. Suppose you are writing code in C sharp. And then I tell you that there are seven C Sharp libraries you could use. How would you use those libraries? Well, by writing C Sharp code to use those libraries, right? Well, it's exactly the same thing. You are writing TypeScript code, but TypeScript compiles it onto JavaScript. So if you know how to write the code in TypeScript, you're just going to write the code in TypeScript to use those libraries. So that's not going to be any different at all. Rather than writing the JavaScript syntax, you'll be writing the TypeScript syntax. That's all it is. And it, it makes no other difference. Yeah, but as long as you have the dependencies provided, it doesn't make any difference. Yep. So the question is, are there scenarios where you would not recommend using TypeScript? Well, so one of the situations you're going to get into is when your deployment is going to be JavaScript. Right. So when it comes to debugging, you could use tools to start debugging. But if you're going to have problems to look at in production, you're not going to look at the TypeScript code at that point. You're going to look at JavaScript code. And that's not a code you generated. Right? It's a code generated by the compiler. As long as you are comfortable with that, it shouldn't be a problem. Right? As long as you're aware of the fact that you, know, you not, normally don't debug at the bytecode level or the IL level, whereas in this case, the production setting is going to be JavaScript. But it's just a question of getting comfortable with it. That, that's the main thing. Yeah. Yep. So I don't have to do anything, right? Uh, I'll just switch is it, is off my phone. Is it trying to solve the right problem? You know, what it is doing is it is taking the flavor of the functional language out of JavaScript. That's not true at all, though. No, but, uh, you know, why, 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 what makes you say that? Uh, you know, the callback example you did. Yeah. It's a, which is also not true. So I'm sorry I misguided you in that. I really feel sad about this. Because you have lambdas. I showed you the example where you can pass filters. So, hang on, hang on. So, so we're talking about JavaScript and TypeScript here. So JavaScript already gives you ability to do functional style to the extent it is. So I showed you an example of calling a filter method. And I showed you how you would do this in JavaScript. I showed you how you can do exactly the same thing with a lot less syntax. So this has not taken anything away from you in any, any means. Right. It doesn't try to impose anything at all. JavaScript gives you a JavaScript gives you imperative way of programming. JavaScript gives you functional way of programming. You get to choose whichever you want to use. TypeScript says, you got those two choices on your hand as well, and you choose whichever you want to. As simple as that. So it's, if I prefer the imperative way, right. I think TypeScript makes my life easier. That's not true at all. TypeScript, it, if, you want to, if you want to put words into my mouth, please go ahead. However, TypeScript gives you what it gives you. It gives you these two tools on your hand, and you decide what to use. As, yep. Yeah, so it doesn't impose or take away anything from you. It still requires discipline on our part to know what we're doing. That doesn't go away. All right, I think that's all I have. Thank you.